We had something the other night when we went out there uh, t- uh, to uh, get the gospel out. It was a real blessing. We had uh, uh, John Jr. was probably the youngest uh, uh, person out there doing any kind of evangelistic work I've ever seen. Uh, and the, the youngest uh, sign holder was, uh, was their little one, Grace Lynn. She was, she was out there holding the sign. Every once in a while, she'd look at me like this. But, but she held the sign nonetheless. And a little Viviana, they were, and, and Isaiah and Emma were holding signs. We had to convince them, hey, you know, you, you don't have to use a sign to hide your face, you know, but the kids did a great job. It was a real blessing. Appreciate them being out. Uh, go in your Bibles to 2 uh, Kings chapter 22. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a little bit. Can I encourage you parents that have your kids in sports? I think sports are great. I really do. I played high school football and basketball. You may look at me and wonder how I did any of that, but I did. Um, And uh, really enjoyed sports. There's a lot of things you can learn from life from them. But I'll also say this, more than likely, not saying this to be offensive, the reality of your child making a living off of sports is pretty slim. Uh, But they can use music for their entire life for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. I encourage you, parents, if you have the opportunity to get your kids to learn an instrument, it's, it'll do something for them. It really does. All right, 2 Kings chapter 22. I'm going to read a couple of verses here, starting in verse number 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned thirty and one years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, so that would be, we're not going to do common core math, I don't know how to get there, but if we use normal math, 8 plus 18 is what? 26! 26, all right, 26, everyone's like, what do we say? The answer, 26, all right? And, uh, and it says here, at, in his 18th year, so he would have been 26, that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, the house of the Lord, saying, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought in the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hands of the doers of the work. Someone's got to do some work, right? you got some doers there. They have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house, unto carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Now, a couple more verses to read here, but if you're getting lost in the weeds, we're going to come back and explain what exactly is going on. This is not just fluff. This is not just boring history. This matters to the story, all right? Uh, uh, how be it, verse number 7, there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered in their hand because they dealt faithfully. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book. Of the law in the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Isn't that novel? You get a book, you read it, right? All right, verse 9, And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered in the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. I want to bring you a message this morning entitled, I Have Found the Book. Brother James, if you'd ask the Lord's blessing on the Word. Amen. Be seated if you would. I, I want to try, if you'll allow me for a little bit, to sort of paint a picture for you, give you a little bit of backdrop to this story. 
It's important, I think, to understand not just the text that we read, but what leads up to that. We see in verse number 8 that, that uh, Hilkiah, the high priest, when he's speaking to the scribe, and the job of the scribe was to write out the words of God. And so when Hilkiah, the high priest, comes to Shaphan, he's got a very, very important and pertinent message for him. And the message was this, I have found the book. And that message changes an entire generation for the nation of Judah. That message, I have found the book, changes everything for that generation. But it's important to understand the, the backdrop to the story. Why are people, uh, why do they have carpenters and builders and masons going in to repair the house of God? If you go back to chapter 21, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but go back there if you would to chapter 21. We're going to skim through here. And I want you to understand that, that leading up to this, what you have is you've got the reign of two kings prior to this king named Josiah. Keep in mind that Josiah is only eight years old when he takes the throne for the, king of, uh, the kingdom of Judah. And if you're, if you're familiar with the, the story of the Old Testament, you've got David, a righteous king, and, and Solomon, the king of peace that comes after him. But Solomon's son was a fool. Isn't it ironic that the guy that writes two books in the Bible about wisdom has a son that's a fool? You know, you're not, you don't, you're not born into anything. You have to decide what you do with the Bible for yourself. And, and so anyways, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, because he's a fool and he listens to the guys that are his age, and he doesn't listen to those that have some wisdom and experience, he splits the kingdom in two. And so for the rest of the Old Testament history, what you have is you've got the kingdoms of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and the kingdom of Judah, the two southern tribes. And of those kings of Judah, what you find out is that the kingdom of Judah, they eventually fall away from God, but it takes them a little longer to fall away than Israel. Israel goes into captivity, the nation of Assyria, and that happens somewhere around 750 B.C., uh, the, uh, the nation of Judah, the, the two southern uh, tribes, the kingdom of Judah, goes into captivity somewhere around 670, 680 B.C. But here's the point. Eventually, Judah falls away as well. You are reading about King Josiah, who was a king of Judah. But what happens prior to this eight-year-old coming to the throne? In chapter 21, you read about a, a man named Manasseh, who was also a young man, only 12 when he took to the throne. But look how long he reigns. He reigns 55 years. Now listen, we've got presidents that serve four, ter uh, four years, and sometimes they serve eight. And depending on which side of politics you line up on, you may look at one guy and go, man, I can't wait for that guy to get done, or will you hope for four more years, or I can't believe we endured eight years of that guy, or whatever the case might be. But here's the thing. After four or eight years, you get a chance to get a new guy. Fifty-five years, this guy reigns. There's no voting. Nobody votes. It's I'm the king. That's it. And for 55 years, the way that he leads Judah is an evil. Look at verse number two. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at verse number three. He built high places. That was something that God told his people not to do. Why? Because all the heathen would build altars on the top of high structures to reach the false gods. And God said, you know what? We're not going to do it like them. Hey, listen, worship in the church should be different than a concert down the road. Are you with me? It should be a little bit different. And what I'm getting at is this, is that the, the nation of Judah, the nation of Israel, they had the truth, they knew it was right, but they wanted to be like everybody around them. Does that not sound like Christianity in 2018? Let's just be like them so we can reach them. Listen, I am all for being all things to all men that we might save some. But can I say this? Jesus Christ never sinned to reach somebody with love. Amen. Here you have a king that for 55 years, what he does is he basically undoes everything that was right. He builds altars, and he builds the altars for Baal, and he worships the host of heaven. And he takes these altars, and he puts them in the house of God. You read that in verse 4 and 5. The house of God, the temple of God, which was to be a special and holy place dedicated to the worship of the one true God. He takes that place, and he fills it with things that would remind you, walking in at, from the get-go, this is no longer God's place. This is a place dedicated to other gods now. That's what Manasseh did for 55 years. In verse number 6, you might think this is unfathomable. You know what he does in verse number 6? 
He takes his own son and he offers his son as a sacrifice to the God, Milcom. You say, how could somebody do that? You have no idea how far you'll go when you reject the authority of God's word in your life. I can tell you this, when he's 12 years old, he probably doesn't think someday I'm going to grow up and someday I can't wait to have a boy and boy, we're going to play football and throw football in the yard and we're going to do this, we're going to do that and I'm going to sacrifice him to a God. But that's where it eventually goes. This is the condition of the nation of Judah at this time. In verse 6, you read about uh, him consulting with familiar spirits and wizards and dark magic and things like that. In verse 7, you read about him putting a graven image in God's house, which is exactly what the Antichrist will do in the tribulation. He is basically doing everything against what he was shown was right. Everything that God's word said, he did the opposite for 50 years. Five years. And let me say this, the pew never rises higher than the pulpit. I learned that a long time ago. I've learned this, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, the company and the, the managers of a company. Listen, listen, you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that, but if you've had a boss or you have a boss currently that strolls in around 10 o'clock when everybody gets there at 8 and they leave at 3 when everybody else leaves at 5, you sort of over time lose respect for that boss. Am I right about that? You lose respect not just for the boss, but for the structure of the, of the office. You lose respect for the office hours. You go, you know what? If they come in at 10, maybe I come in at 9. It's not that big of a deal. Why? Because the pew never rises higher than the pulpit. If this is what the king is doing, what do you think the people of the land are doing for 55 years? In verse 9, look if you would at verse 9. It says, They hearken not. Manasseh seduced them to do more evil then did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Look, if you would, at verse number 13. You know what God says as a result of this? I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish. Ladies, the next time you want your, your husband to help you with the dishes, you quote 2 uh, Kings 21, 13, and you tell him, it's Bible, honey. As a man wipeth a dish. If you come over to my house, you see me doing the dish, I'm going to say, I'm doing it very manly-like. Because the Bible says it, just like that. You know what he says, though? Look what God says. Wiping it and turning it upside down. You know what he's basically saying? I'm going to wipe you guys off the face of the earth. You say, why? Because of what's been going on for the last 55 years. And then, after Manasseh, you read later in this chapter, there's a young man named Ammon. He's 22 years old. When he begins to reign, he only reigns two years. And guess what he does? He does that which is evil in the sight of the Lord as well. So you know what you have? You have 57 years of evil reigning in this country. Look, Christians in America, you look at certain things. You look at the, the you know, abortion movement and this uh, thing and that thing and taking the rights away. You go, man, things are getting bad. They're not as bad as they were back then. Not yet. Imagine that for 57 years. And everybody acting like it's normal to, to offer your children as sacrifices to other gods. Now, some of you here this morning, you have a hard time with that. But, you know, we do that sometimes as well. You offer your kids on the altar of what is popular versus what is right. Well, everybody else, all the other kids are doing it. It doesn't matter what, hey, are their kids going to pay your bills? Right? Listen, I'm telling you, for 57 years, that is exactly what's going on in Judah. Until one day an eight-year-old comes to the throne. And he starts watching things. And over the next 18 years of his life, those are silent years we don't know much about. But over the next 18 years of his life, I think he starts seeing that everything that had been done prior to him was wrong. He just didn't know how to make it right. You say, why? He didn't have the book. Christian, can I tell you something? You may look over your life and go, man, I've messed up here. Man, I've messed up here. Man, I wish I hadn't done that. Man, I wish I could go back. Listen, I've looked into the science. There is no DeLorean that flies back in time. Okay? You are where you're at in 2018. You're not going back. But I can tell you this. If you can get a hold of the Word of God and you can find the book in your life, it'll make a difference. 
Listen, what, 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 what Josiah had was he had hope that things could be better, but he didn't know how to actually get there. Aren't you glad you've got a book that gives you directions in where to go and how to get there? Aren't you glad if you're saved this morning, you're not like, well, I hope I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I, I hope I didn't mess up. Enough. Aren't you glad the Bible says, these things have I written on you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Listen, there's a confidence that comes with that. And I'm going to talk about that later this morning. My point is this. You've got the book that gives you direction. Why? You found the book. Here's a question. If they had found the book, you know what that means? The book was lost for a period of time. Can I say this? You can do that too. Why was it lost? I don't know. Maybe there's just a bunch of stuff in the way. I am notorious for going, honey, where are my keys? I'm, you know, I, I, honey, where's my wallet? And it's always, you know, it's always her fault if I can't find it. I know I put it here. And she's like, no, honey, I haven't seen it. You know, and, and she's really sweet and nice and gracious. And, uh, but, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, man, I know it was there. I lose stuff all the time. And I can't tell you, you know what? James and Debbie are moving this weekend. Free plug. There's a little commercial for you. If you want to help them, go help them move, all right? And, and so I guarantee this. If it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. You're going to be going through stuff going, oh. That's where that went. You ever done that? Sometimes the book gets lost in your life simply because there's just so much stuff in the way. Sometimes the book gets lost because of covering it up with a false sense of religion. How much time do you spend in this book? How much time is that book spending in you? Sometimes it's lost because it becomes irrelevant due to the habits in your life. Sometimes it becomes lost because of sin being embraced and it's hidden on purpose. Let me tell you right now, there's an old saying, either this book will keep you from your sin or your sin will keep you from this book. And oftentimes the book gets thrown around and it just gets covered up by other stuff on purpose. Why? Because I know if I get in that book and I start reading it again and it starts touching my life, it's going to change me. That is exactly the point. It is intended by God to change your life. It's intended to put a spark in you that wasn't there before. See, Pastor Adrian, I can't believe you throw your Bible like that. Hey, you know what I think is more disrespectful? Never opening it. Do you know how many people died to give you this Bible? 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22, can I say this? When it was found, it was because they reset their priorities. I don't think that it's a coincidence that in verse number 5 and in verse number 6, that they have dedicated time, they've dedicated money, they've dedicated labor to going in and fixing up the house of God. Listen, Josiah doesn't have the Bible yet, but here's what he knows. He knows this much in the last 18 years he's been watching, and not a whole lot of people go to church anymore. He's going, man, in the last 18 years I haven't seen... Maybe five people open the doors of that temple. And, and when they come out, they talk about what it's like, and it's, it's not like it used to be, and everything's in disarray, and the, the timber is, is rotting, and, and the things that used to shine are dull, and there's dust everywhere. And, and where they used to, to have the altar of incense, man, you can't even tell that's what it is. And where they used to wash and the brazen labor, you can't even tell what that is. And nothing is like it once was. And God didn't ever change. It wasn't God that changed, it was the people. And Josiah is watching this and he knows, okay guys, time out. We've got to reset our priorities somehow. He doesn't yet have the Bible, but he knows this much. If that's God's house, we need to go in it and we need to fix it up and it needs to be given the honor and the glory that our God deserves. I don't think it's a coincidence that when they reset their priorities and they get their eyes focused on things that have to do with God again, that that's when they find the Bible. I would say this, when they found it, they were willing to put something back into their Christianity, so to speak. You know what they had dedicated? Money and time and resources and labor. Can I say this? Salvation is free. Can I get an amen there? Amen. Man, we're Baptists. We like free, amen? You know, we're going to have a fellowship over here, and what that means is free food. You know, we're going to go do this, and hey, all right, what are we going to be eating, right? I mean, we like free. You know, it's like when, when someone says, you know, hey, brother, I've got this need. I'll pray for you. That's code for, I'm not going to help you at all. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and whenever, whenever 
someone wants to give you something, let me be a blessing to you, right? You know, and I'll, I'll be a blessing if I'm taking it, right? We like free. Listen, salvation is free. What a blessing. It didn't cost you a thing. But man, if you're going to grow in the Christian life and you're going to be challenged and this thing's going to become real to you and you're going to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, it's going to cost you something. Salvation free, discipleship and Christianity comes with a price tag. They're cleaning things up there in the house of God and as they start to clean things up, that's when they find this old dusty book. And they, they go, what do you think this is? Kids these days, you open up a map, and they're like, what is that? <laughs> I mean, a map, I know it shows up on a phone, but what is it doing on paper? <laughs> uh, we were talking about this last night. Me and my wife were getting old enough to, to where we used to be like the youngest in every crowd. Yeah. You know, and now we're getting older, and we're not there anymore and it's sort of bothering us because I'll mention you know something from the 80s or ALF or something like that or whatever it doesn't matter G.I. Joe and the kids are like uh. <laughs> you know we're talking about how we used to when we were missionaries going to South America we would break open the map you know and I could just see on my kids face like how did you get somewhere with that <laughs> how'd you get anywhere without a woman telling you in a great British accent where to turn <laughs> They open this thing up and they go, what do you think it is? I have no idea. Some kind of magazine, some kind of subscription. Maybe it's ESPN, the magazine. Maybe it says, and they start floating through there. They start flipping through. They go, no, 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 no. This is, a, this is not what we thought it was. Well, what is it? It's a book like no book. And they start flipping through and they start crying because they realize this is the book that God gave us. And we lost it. And they remembered that the oracles of God were given to the Jews and they were the people of the book. And they'd lost the book that had given them their identity. Can I say this today? No differently, no differently than the Jews in that time. I would say that Christians have lost some of their identity because they're no longer a people of the book. Well, I, I think this and I like this and at my church we do it this way. And Hey, listen, what does the Bible say? Well, you know, our tradition is this way, and we like this, and we like, listen, opinions and preferences are like armpits. We all have, it, have them, and oftentimes they stink. Amen. You need the book in your life more than anything else. They said, I have found the book. You say, why? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says, all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. What makes this book different is it is inspired by God. You can read all kinds of good books. I'm for reading books. I enjoy reading books. I like reading a lot about history. I enjoy it. But let me tell you something that's a shame. Most Christians today are reading books about a book that they're not reading. What I'm getting at is this, guys. You need to get back to the Bible. Or maybe I should say it this way. Catch up to the Bible. I think sometimes we got it backwards. It's not so much that we got to go back to it. It's gone. It's still going. It's still moving. Why? It's alive. <laughs> Peter says it this way, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came on old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God inspired the words in this book. That is what makes this book different. Within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems that men face. Ronald Reagan said that. Abraham Lincoln, but for this book we could not know right from wrong. Isn't that the truth? Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. You believe that? All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. The Bible was not given simply for our information, but for our transformation, D.L. Moody. Charles Spurgeon says, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't. It's good. 
I like what this guy says. If you really want to be a rebel, get a job, cut your grass, read your Bible, and shut up because nobody else is doing that. Right. <laughs> Some people like to read so many Bible chapters every day. Charles Spurgeon says, I would not dissuade them from the practice, but I'd rather lay my soul a soak in half a dozen verses all day than rinse my hand in several chapters. Oh, to be bathed in a text of Scripture and to let it be sucked up in your very soul till it saturates your heart. Yeah. You know, these days, a lot of people these days don't know much about Jesus, but they, they follow Gandhi pretty closely. You know what Gandhi said about the Bible? You Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilizations to pieces. Turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet, but you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. That's a good rebuke. You know what he's saying? You guys have all the answers in that book. And yet you act like it's just any other book. I have found the book. Can I say this? Can I just speak from a little bit of experience myself? When I found the book, I want to give you a couple things I found. Number one, I found confidence. I found confidence when I found this book. I read a story about Hugh Latimer, who was a Protestant reformer back in the 1500s, and he stood before Henry VIII, and he preached a message that Henry VIII, you know, Henry VIII I am, Henry VIII I am. If, Again, if you were born in 1990 or four, you don't know what is going on right now, all right? But, uh, but anyways, Henry VIII, he's listening to this message from Hugh Latimer. Uh, listen, I, I probably, Brother Jose was talking about, you know, here in a little bit, we're going to have a good message. And I'm thinking, Brother, set their expectations a little lower. <laughs> Just tell them a message. And that way, when they walk out with whatever their opinion is, I'm okay. You know, I probably preached a message that have bothered people, offended people, people didn't like, people thought they stunk, whatever. But I've never been threatened with my life for preaching a message that, that you didn't like. Hugh Latimer stood before Henry VIII and he preached this entire message and Henry VIII basically said to him, Hugh, dost thou not know from whence thou comest upon whose message thou art sent? Even by the great and mighty God who is all present and who beholdeth all thy ways and who is able to cast thy soul into hell. The guy's a hypocrite. Therefore take care that thou deliverest thy message faithfully. Let me give you the, the modern translation on that. Okay? Don't ever preach that message again. Whatever message it was that he preached, he told Hugh Latimer, don't ever preach it again. I don't want to hear it. You know what Hugh Latimer does the very next Sunday? The exact same message. And he does it longer. <laughs> you say, what is that? Confidence. You say, why? Because he had the book in his life. Can I say this? I have confidence in my salvation. Listen, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. What I'm talking about is something maybe you've never experienced. But if you're saved this morning, can I say this? It is a blessing to know whom you have believed in. Paul says it this way. Uh, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What is that day? That is the day he changes your vile body into the body likened in the image of his only son, Jesus Christ. That is a sure fact that is going to happen in your future if you're saved. How do you know? You have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You know why I'm confident in my salvation? Not because I live a great life. Not because I'm a pastor. I'm confident in my salvation because of what the book says. I can have, listen guys, I'll tell you this right now. When you're not sure if you're saved, it makes it a little bit harder to know how to approach somebody with the gospel. Am I right about that? People that are always doubting whether or not they're saved. If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to help somebody else? Man, I'm confident, but it's not because of me. It's because of this book. I am confident in my salvation. You say, why? I found the book. <laughs> I found the book. Watchman Nee, a guy that wrote a bunch of books on prayer. One time he had a guy over at his house, and this guy's struggling with whether or not he's saved. And, and Watchman Nee asked him, he says, hey, brother, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? He went through what that meant, and the man says, yes. He goes, well, listen, uh, I believe you're saved, but you don't know, I, I was thinking this the other day, and what if I'm not really saved? And he's just battling with this thing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Watchman just said, brother, look at that dog. He says, what about it? He says, well, that's my dog. He goes, okay. 
Now, that dog doesn't ever make a mess of anything. That dog will get up when I say get up. It'll go when I say go. That dog is perfectly obedient. Nothing like the dogs at my house. <laughs> you know, my, my wife's got a dog that she thinks like hung the moon, and that dog will eat anything. It has eaten all the lights that I've put out. In the, you know those little solar lights, you know? I was all proud of all my yard work, and I put them out, and I come home, and I'm like, huh, that's weird. I swear I put that right there. And, and then I go to the backyard, and they're all chewed on. And I'm like, that dog's going to die, you know? <laughs> oh, I like, no, honey, please. It's, she, she's a good dog. He says, look at that dog. That dog listens to everything I say. He does everything I ask him to do. He doesn't make any mess. He's perfectly obedient. And the guy goes, okay. He goes, do you hear the, the baby, my baby boy in the other room? Yeah. He's screaming right now. Uh-huh. That baby makes a mess of everything. <laughs> he throws food on the ground. He's ornery at times. Who's going to inherit my stuff when I die? Yeah, right. Now, in 2018, you have to specify it's not the dog. Right. <laughs> okay? It's the kid. That's the point of the story. You know what he's saying? It's not so much based on the behavior of the person in line. It's based on the relationship with the one who has something to offer. And if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I say this? You are on your way to heaven. I have assurance of my salvation. You say, why? Because the book says I can. Can I say this? I am confident not just in my salvation, but in my Savior. You don't know Jesus Christ unless you get this book. You don't know about his temptation. You don't know about how he, he's tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. You don't learn about his, his death and his burial. You don't learn about his love and his sacrifice and self-sacrifice and, and how they would smack him and, and mock him. And yet he would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Aren't you glad for those words being written down in a book for you to read? You look at all the problems in the world. The problems of the world can be solved by one man named Jesus Christ, and you read about him in a book. What am I saying, guys? I am confident in my Savior, not only that he died, but that he was buried and he rose again. You say, why? Because I've got a book that tells me that. Confident in my stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I read a story about a preacher named H.P. Hughes in London, England, about late 1800s. There was a man named Charles Bradlaff that was an, a devout atheist, and that's really when atheism was on the rise, late 1800s, and that's where you have textual criticism, and people start changing the Bible, and all kinds of stuff starts changing in education. And this guy named Charles Bradlaff said, uh, hey, preacher, Hey, you think the Bible is amazing? You think the, the Bible is perfect? And he says, look, I found this mistake, this mistake. And he would show him, hey, that's not a mistake. That's over here it says this, over here it says this. And he goes, well, you know what? I just think all this stuff's blown. He goes, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You don't believe in it, right? Nope, don't believe in it. He goes, then it wouldn't bother you at all to find about 100 people whose lives have been made better by your idea of atheism. They set a date. He said, you bring your 100, I'll bring mine. The day came. Charles Bradlaff was nowhere to be found. Hundred people got up and gave testimonies about how the Bible changed their life and saved their soul. Amen. And people got saved at that meeting. Amen. I am confident in my stand for the gospel. Look, can I say this, guys? For some of you, it may be weird, and I, I totally understand. Some of you may, by, by person, I'd be more reserved, but can I say this? Every once in a while, stepping out a little bit and making yourself a fool for Jesus Christ because of the gospel will do you some good. It'll show you that, look, you could sit on a, on a corner and talk about politics or all kinds of things going on in the world. Some people like it, some people hate you. But the reaction to the gospel shows you there's something supernatural about that message. There is something unique about it. And you know what happens as you, as you get in this book? You become more confident in your stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, can I ask you a question? Did the Holy Spirit change in the last 2,000 years? Did God change... I'll tell you what's changed. The church has changed. Right. You know what you read about those early Christians, those disciples? When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know one of the markers that you have been with Jesus Christ and your life is different is there is a boldness 
and a confidence, and dare I say it like this, maybe even a swagger, because you know how the story ends. And you know that even though you look like an idiot to some people, you're on the winning side. Listen, there, there is something that happens when you get in this book and you realize that the gospel message is real and it can change people's lives. When you see that take place and then you give the gospel, I'll tell you this, if you've never led somebody to the Lord, I, I, I want to encourage you, I want to tell you, you're missing out on one of the greatest things that could be experienced in this life. There is nothing like taking the gospel to someone that's lost and seeing them accept Christ as their Savior and then see their life change because of the Word of God. Amen. It'll give you a confidence. I'm telling you right now. I'm confident in my stand for the gospel, not because of me, but because of what His words have to say. I'm confident in my stand on the Scriptures. Can I say this? This book stands alone scientifically. Right. Some of you even maybe this morning go, well, there's science and there's the Bible. I would say, no, there's science falsely so-called, and then there's the Bible. The Bible even talks about science falsely so-called. Can I say this, guys? The longer I'm in this book, the more I realize this is like no other book. And it gives me a confidence to think about it, to memorize it, to give it to other people. It gives me a confidence to know that it is right. Guys, it stands alone scientifically. Here's a question. They, they laugh about Christians. They go, you guys are like flat earthers. I'm like, no. We've been round globers since Isaiah. You say, what, 600 years before Christ? You, write, you read the words, he that sitteth on the circle of the earth. Talking about the, the world being circular, and they don't figure this thing out until the, the, past the dark ages. It's there 600 years before Christ. Don't tell me about science. I'll tell you. That stuff isn't what they want to call. Guys, by the way, what they call science changes every couple years. Am I right about that? I mean, you know, I, I remember dun dun da da dun da da dun da dun 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 da da dun da dun da dun 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 If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's Rocky, okay? You know what Rocky does in that scene? He takes some raw eggs and he drinks them. Why? Protein! Also possibly salmonella. You know what? Every couple years they tell you, hey, this is a good fat for you. About two years later, that's a bad fat. What what's wrong with you? Aren't you an you're an idiot? Well, you said it was a good fat. Yeah, we changed. Who remembers the nine planets? <laughs> I don't even know. I can't keep up anymore. This one's a dwarf star. It wasn't really a planet. This one's this. I'm like, whatever. You guys just keep doing what you're doing. I'll stick with the book. This book is scientifically accurate. It talks about the constellations of Orion and Pleiades thousands of years. That is written in Job. That goes back 3,000 years before Christ, guys. This book is far beyond anything that they have out there. You know what scientists have recently discovered? They've recently discovered there's a body of water way up there in the heavens, and the Bible calls it the firmament, and it's been there since Genesis chapter number 1. I'm telling you, they're going to catch up to the Bible. It's not us going back to it. My point is this, I am confident in this book because it is scientifically accurate. How about this? Wash your hands for crying out loud. You know, we tell our kids, wash your hands. L listen, you need to understand that, that simple thing, you know, you go to the restaurant, you better pray those people that are making your food are washing their hands. We've experienced when they don't, it ain't pretty. There was a man named Philip Semmelweis in the 1800s, he was a Hungarian man. And Philip Semmelweis uh, had discovered something that he came across because of what the Bible says about washing hands. And you know what he said? He, he came up to this thing. He, he died at like 40-something years old. And he, he died. sort of a sad story because he died alone and everybody had rejected his teachings. He was the only one. He was a doctor. And he noticed that the practice of the day, get this, ladies, are you ready for this? The practice of the day was in the morning, first thing in the morning, the doctors would go to the morgue and they would do research on dead bodies. And then later on in the day, they'd go deliver babies. And nobody ever washed their hands. 1,840 years after Christ, we still don't have it figured out. The whole washing hands thing is pretty recent, by the way, scientifically. Do you know the Jews had that in 1800 B.C.? Running water, not just, hey, you know what they were doing? They're taking a bowl and go, okay, we'll wash hands. Here's a bowl. Wash my hands. Here, pass it down. You wash your hands, and they're just spreading germs. The Bible says use running water, 1800 B.C. 
Guys, I'm sorry. I will never apologize to anyone that thinks they're smart because they take what they call science over the Bible. I'm not going to do it. You say, why? I am confident that this book is scientifically accurate. Can I say this alone? It stands alone historically. You guys, you'll, you'll read about things and you'll find there the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is that? Historical fact. You'll read about governors and, and, and this person was the governor of Syria and this person was the governor of this. And you go, who cares about any of that stuff? Let me tell you why it's important. Because it backs up what we also know from secular history showing that the Bible is historically accurate. It stands alone in literature. I read a thing by a guy named Charles McGrath in April 23rd, 2011 from the New York Times. I'm not going to read it all to you, but he writes this thing at the 400-year anniversary of the King James Bible, and he said this. He said that there is no work that has been surpassed, that will ever surpass the language of the King James Bible. He acknowledges that even in their day, when they wrote those words, the language was already outdated 50 years. You know what they realized, those translators? They realized something. Even if it is outdated 50 years now, there's something eloquent and, 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 and dignified about this language. And I would say it like this. Elevate your language. Don't deflate the Bible. But here's my point. It stands alone in literature. There is no book like this book. It stands alone in prophecy. You show me another book that gives all the prophecies that the Bible does. Only just in reference to the prophecies of Jesus Christ being born and coming the first time, the probabilities of all those things lining up the way that they did are one with 23 zeros after them. That's a different kind of book. It stands alone in its divinity and its inspiration and preservation. Can I say this? Look at Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew 4. I can be confident in my stand against sin. Matthew chapter number 4. You know I've learned about young people? Young people are pretty genuine for the most part. Start getting up in the later teen years and they start mimicking what they see around them from the adults and they get better at lying and the facade and all that. You know what most young people would readily admit? They're not so confident in themselves. See, how do you know? They look around and see what everybody else is doing. How do you know? They all dress the same. Right. I'm not picking on I'm just being, let's, right? Do you remember, you guys, okay, for some of you, maybe a long time ago, but you remember being a teenager? <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe it was bell bottoms in your day. In my day, it was the saggy, baggy pants. <laughs> and now it's the, you know, how tight can you get them? <laughs> and how ripped can you get them, you know? And, and, and so, but what am I getting at? Everyone sort of looks around and goes, what are they doing? I want to be like them. I don't want to be the only one. I don't want, you say why? Because most, by nature, we're not confident in ourselves. Someone has to put something in us to make us confident. And I'm going to tell you right now, you know where you get that? You get that from the Bible. Listen, Josiah was going to have to do a lot of things. It was going to take a lot of guts. Josiah did stuff at 26 that some 40 and 50 year old men still wouldn't be willing to do today for Jesus Christ. You say, why? He found the book. Look at Matthew chapter number four. Can I show you that my Savior was tempted like you and I are? Matthew chapter four, look if you would at verse number one. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. I like the commentary there. For me, it's like 40 minutes. You know, <laughs> like after 40 days, he was hungry. I'm like, yeah, right. I would think so. Look at verse three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. You know what the work and ministry of the devil in your life is to make you doubt what God said? If God really means this, you know what Jesus responds with? But he answered and said, it is written. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You got another temptation where the devil takes him into a, a pinnacle on the top of the temple. Look at verse 6. And he says, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Look at verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. You say, what is that? You can overcome sin by what God says in his word. You do not have to fall prey to the same stuff over and over and over. You know where the answers come from, though? They come from here. That's why Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. If you're going to have victory over sin, you've got to know what the Bible says to you. 
When you get in this book, you know it'll give you it'll give you confidence that no, I don't have to look at that. No, I don't have to listen to that. No, I don't have to go in that direction. No, I don't have to do what the rest of the world around me is saying is right because I know it's not. I know how that ends. The Bible gives me confidence that God is right regardless of what they say a good time is. I can have confidence. Look, if you would, down at verse number 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kings of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You know what he says there three times distinctly? It is written. It is written. It is written. You know what gave him the confidence to push back and resist the devil? Guys, you're talking about the creator of the universe. The one that said, let there be light, and there was light. You believe that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Talking about Jesus Christ, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You can't mistake it. It's talking about Jesus. And it says in that passage in John 1, He was the Creator. The Creator of the universe is being tempted by the devil because He's in a human body. After being alone and isolated for 40 days and 40 nights, no food, no water, and there He is alone with the devil. The only resource He had was the book. Can I say this? I found confidence. I know I've given some of my life story. I won't bore you with all of it, but I can tell you this. At 13, 14, 15 years old, if you told me that I was going to preach anywhere at all, I probably would have said you're crazy. <laughs> you say, what gives you confidence to do it? I got the authority from the Bible. Man, it changes everything. It's not about me, and it's not about my delivery. God knows that. It's about this book. Guys, you can stand on it when you've got it. When you find this in your life, and you put it back in the center, it does something for you. Can I say this? I found some consistency. You know what the Bible will do? Here's why most Christians live their life. Up, down, up, down, up, down. You say, why? It's about how you feel. I don't feel saved today. Uh, I, you know, I, I feel like God's really working on my side. That's code for he's giving me what I want right now. And things aren't going so well right now. I just wonder if God's even real. Is the Bible real? He said, what is that? You're going to be a yo-yo for the rest of your life if that's how you're governed. You've got to get beyond being managed by your emotions, and you've got to get your emotions in check and in line with something that never changes. You know how many Christians, they come to church, they listen to the Word of God, things are going well, somewhere in a sermon. Now, here's what I don't understand. You'll watch stuff on TV that's offensive to Jesus Christ. Everybody will laugh about it. You'll see, see, see things on, on the movies, they'll, they'll, you know, this kind of language and say that kind of word and this kind of thing. You'll see all kinds of stuff. And you'll, well, yeah, it's not so great, but there's some good stuff in there. Kind of a church or preachers or something that offends you one time, I'm never going back. Yeah. You know what you need in your life? You need some consistency. You know what the Bible does for you? It gives you that. You know what it says in Psalm 119? Psalm 119 and verse number 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know what will help you keep from getting offended and constantly doing like this for the rest of your life? Falling in love with this book. If you love what his word says, guys, let's be honest, there's some things in that book that I don't like, I don't feel I can do. I don't, you know, I, I, as soon as I read certain things, I'm like, God, you have to say it like that. Lord, could you have said it like this? And he says, no, that's exactly how I said it. I'm like, Lord, it'd be a little bit easier. Well, that's not how I wrote it, son. <laughs> I wrote it that way for a reason. And listen, whenever I come to a place in my life where I say, you know what, even if I don't like it, I'm going to love it. And I'm going to embrace it. You know what it does? It brings some consistency in my life. Have you ever, I don't know what your favorite food is, but I'm just going to give you a little bit about mine, one of mine. I like gummy bears. <laughs> I do. But I like a very specific brand. It's Haribo. In case you want it for my birthday, it's April 29th. Haribo is spelled H-A-R-I-B-O, okay? Okay. <laughs> 
Man, there's something about those guys. There's a consistency to them, and I like putting them. You guys may think this is weird. I like them in the fridge, and they come out, and they're cold, and they're sort of they're chewy, but they're not too hard. And, and then someone recommended these, like, I don't know what they were. They were imposter gummy bears. <laughs> and I tasted them, and I put them in my mouth, and it felt like slime going down. And I said, this is disgusting. I said, what is? And they're like, no, these are the best. I said, you know what? There's something not right about it. And I finally said, it's the consistency. There's something wrong with the way that it feels in my mouth. Can I say this? The people around you are experiencing your life, and they are tasting of your Jesus through how you live. And when you're doing like this, they go, you know what? It looks good, and it smells good, and it feels like it would taste good, but there's just something about the consistency that's not right. You know, help you out? Getting a real relationship with this Bible. Let me encourage you. Read it every day. Can I encourage you? Memorize it. Can I go a step further? Study it. Can, 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 I, can, I, can I encourage you to do this every morning before you turn on your phone, before you start flipping through your feed, before you read about the news, before you start reading the paper, whatever your morning routine is, before you lay your eyes on anything else, maybe get into that book. It'll change your life if that's the first thing you look at in the morning. Can I recommend you something else? Listen, I, 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 I have a habit because I'm very busy at night. I tend to defrag a little bit. And sometimes I'll watch about five, ten minutes of the news. And I'll just, just slip through there. But I'll tell you what, it is so much better, if, if I, even if I am going to do that, that after I do that, before I shut my eyes and everything sort of closes down for the night, that I lay my eyes back on this. Man, it does something for you. See, Pastor, I don't have time. Who are you trying to kid? Who are you trying to kid? I mean, you don't have time. You have time to eat. You have time to Facebook. You have time to tweet. You have time to Instagram. You have time to email. You have time to text. You have time to talk. You have time to wash the car. These are, you know, well, those are necessary things in life. Some of that list are. But here's the point. You make time for what you think is important. Over in Matthew 13, you read about a sower. He sows out the seed. Go there with me, if you would, to Matthew 13. I found consistency in this book. You know what will keep you from getting offended? The Bible. You say, why? It teaches you not to take yourself so seriously. I'm serious. You, you know, we have a really overinflated sense of our own self. You know, how dare they treat me that way? You ever been in traffic and someone cuts you off and you're like, <gasps> you start rebuking them in the name of Jesus, right, with some other colorful language. How dare they do that to me? Cut, just cut it out. You're not that important. Amen. Don't look at me like that. It's true. I'm, t I'm being serious with you right now. None of us are. You say, no, Pastor, every one of us really. Yes, in the, in the sight of God, I get exactly what you're saying. But when you start going, how dare they? You've got an overinflated sense of self. And what's, what's happened is someone has moved to the center of your life, and it's no longer the Lord, and it's no longer the Bible. Over there in Matthew 13, you read about a sower going forth to sow, and I want you to notice what happens in verse number 21. Matthew 13 and verse 21. Yet hath he not rooted himself. This is talking about the, the seed that went into stony places. And at first he received the word and was glad with it. But, but look what happens. He has no root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is what? You know, there's, there's two kinds of relationships you can have with the Bible. You can be offended with it, or you can have it in your life as first, and it keep you from getting offended at everything else. You know, I learn about mature Christians. They can have people say stuff about them, and they just keep trucking. They can have Christians treat them bad at church, and they keep coming. They can have people that, that don't even say thank you for what they did, and it doesn't matter. They just keep going. You say, why? They're not offended with that. Because this is first in their life. Amen. It teaches you not to take yourself so ser seriously. It, te it teaches you not to take people so seriously. Do you know what they think about me? Who cares? Sometimes they like you. Sometimes they hate you. Man, I've had people, Pastor, I love you so much. <laughs> Month later, I can't find him with the FBI. <laughs> or maybe I don't want to find him because they're trashing my name. I don't know. But, but here's the point. It's like this with people, is it not? You've got a person in Jesus Christ that never changes. 
And you read about them, and you learn about them, and you get to know them through this book. You guys remember Haman in the Old Testament? The story of Esther, and Haman was the guy that, because of Mordecai, the Jew, not bowing, every time that Haman would have walked by, you know, he gets to see Haman. He's going in there, and he's on, this, on, the, on, the, on the train there, and, and they're, they're bringing him in, and everyone's, oh, Haman, you're so wonderful. Haman, you know, and Haman's, vote for me. I'm Haman, you know, and look at me. Here I am, and, and, and there's this one guy. Everybody else is going like this. Everybody else is giving all the platitudes. And, we love you, Haman. You're the greatest. Did you see I sent you a Facebook friend request? And, you know, and they're talking. They're yelling, yes, I got that. I'll get back to you later, you know, and, and so he's going down the road. He's all excited about everyone just noticing how wonderful he is. And there's just one, one guy, one, one out of thousands that would not bow. And it ruined Haman's life. Ahab has the entire kingdom. He can do whatever he wants. He could buy any piece of, he can go somewhere and, and buy a piece of land over here and build a nice garden for himself. You know what? And there's this one guy who's got a, a, a little garden over here right next to the, uh, the palace in Jezreel. And that one guy would not sell to Ahab. And Ahab goes, look, I'll buy it from you. And that guy goes, look, it's not right for you to buy it from me. This is my inheritance from my fathers. I'm not supposed to sell it to anybody. Even if you are the king, that's what God commanded. And Ahab goes, And he goes home and he sucks his thumb and pouts to his wife, right? And she goes, don't worry, honey, I'll take care of him. You know, and she puts out a video online about how, you know, this guy is a real bad guy. We need to get rid of him and gets the crowd all excited and, and basically gets the guy killed. Why? Ahab was offended because he couldn't get one thing. There was one thing he couldn't have. He said, what's the problem? He wasn't in love with that book. Haman got offended because one person went about ruined his entire life. You see, what was the problem? He was looking to man. It'll give you some consistency. Listen, Josiah needed this to keep him on track. There are going to be people who are going to disagree with him. There are going to be people who are going to doubt him. You know what? Can I say this? He was going to doubt himself. Can I say as a pastor, there are times I've made decisions and I go, man, I, I don't know if that was the right one. If you'd asked me, I would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But inside, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I had to do? To go, you know where I, any, any confidence at all would come from going back to, okay, God, what do you say about this? Amen. You know where the consistency would come in? From here. Let me give you this lastly. I found the book, and I found cleansing. A couple years ago, I met a young man who his exact words downtown Denver, DU student, studying to be a law professor or something. He said this, I have tried to atone for my sins. I've tried to clean up my life, and I can't. Long story short, we go through some scripture, and about 30 minutes later, he's bowing his knee right there on the sidewalk, downtown Denver, and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior. Amen. You see, what did he find that day? He found some cleansing. The Bible says this. Look, if you would, at Psalm 119. Go with me there. Psalm 119. We'll wrap this up. Psalm 119, verse 9. Great question is asked. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? You know how your life gets cleaned up? You know how your mind gets cleaned up? You know how your habits get cleaned up? Do you know how your talk gets cleaned up? It does not happen apart from this book right here. Brother Naylor, the Naylor family joined our church here recently, and he was giving his testimony. He's talking about how after he got saved, one of the things he asked God to do is to help him with his language. And he said it was amazing how the next day he'd gone through the day and he realized he hadn't used this word and that word. and this. He was literally a sailor. Man, he's in the Navy. You know, the, the term cuss like a sailor. There's a reason that term exists. And he gets through that day and he goes, man, Lord, what is going on? You, you're helping me with this. You say, what was it? It was the word of God. You know what's going to cleanse you? You know what's going to clean up your life and clean up your path and clean up your family and clean up your habits? It's the Bible. You say, why? It exposes our weaknesses, our nature, our attitude towards sins, and it shows us a solution for sin. 
over in 2 Kings, and I want you to go over there real quickly as we wrap this up. In 2 Kings chapter number 23, we're not going to read all the verses, but if you took the time to read the chapter, you'd read about all the things that Josiah did to clean up the nation of Israel. You'd read about how he destroyed the false altars, he broke down the images, burnt them to powder, and threw them out in the ashes of the gra- the ashes out in the, the graves of the children of Israel. You'd read about all these things that he did. He broke down the house of the Sodomites. He did all kinds of stuff to clean up the, the land. You say, where did he get all those ideas? How did he know what to do to clean everything up? He listened to the book that was read to him. You want it to be clean, you want to be cleaned up? Get the book in your life. I want you to see it in chapter number 22, if you go back there. Josiah in verses 11, 12, and 13 hears from God. Something he had not experienced his entire life up to that point. You say, why? Verse 11 says, When the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. You say, what was it? That was God speaking to him. And in turn, he tells Shaphan and Hilkiah, Hey, would you go and inquire? Go ask God what he thinks about this and what we should do here. You see what happened? The lines of communication were open again between him and God. Where did it start? Finding the book. Finding the book. Chapter 23, look at verse 2. Can I say this? The Bible brings compassion in your life. When you find the Bible and you put it where it ought to be in your life, you find compassion for others to hear the truth. Notice verse 2. The king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their ears all the words of the book. You know, when you get into this book, you realize, man, heaven's real, hell's real. I want to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. And I say this lastly, it brought a complete turnaround. Look, if you would, at chapter 23 and verse number 22. You know what they do? They hold a Passover. And it says in chapter 23 and verse 22 that there was a Passover that they had like no other had ever been held before. In verse 25, can I say that one of the greatest things you could ever have happen is for God to compliment you? People change. They'll compliment you, then they'll stab you in the back, they'll say good things, they'll say bad things. If God compliments you, that lasts forever. Look at verse 25. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might According to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. That, my friends, is a great compliment to get. You know how he came to that conclusion in his life? You know how he turned everything around? It started with finding the book. Listen, if you're saved this morning, you need this in your life desperately like you need air. You eat three times a day, let me say this, you need to at least read it once a day. Can I say this? If you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ, there's a different book. There's a book that God has of all the things you've ever done, of all the works that you've ever committed, and someday at the great white throne judgment, that book is going to be open, and you know what God's going to say? Depart from me, I never knew you, because I can't find your name in my book of life. But can I say this? That could change today. If you walk out of here without Jesus Christ, that's on you. But I'll tell you right now, you can be saved today. You can have your life changed. You can have your soul saved and your spirit revived inside of you. You say, what does that come through? It comes from accepting what God says in this book. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. And if you're willing to, by faith, accept what Christ did for you, you can be born again. And take that book of the works of your life and just get them expunged. And have your name transferred into another book called the Book of Life. If you're here without Jesus Christ, can I encourage you to get saved? Christian, can I encourage you to find the book in your life? 